Again, as I mentioned, over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be revisiting very, very memorable and at some points controversial Marvel films that were developed by 20th Century Fox. Obviously, as already stated today, we're starting off with the original X-Men trilogy that came out between 2000 and 2006. In our next episode that's going to be dropping in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about Daredevil and Elektra. And then after that, we're going to talk about the two Fantastic Four movies, Fantastic Four and Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer that came out in 2005, 2007. We're also going to, of course, talk about the Wolverine trilogy, Wolverine Origins, The Wolverine in 2013, and last but not least, Logan. And then we obviously have to revisit the X-Men prequel series, which has four films that includes First Class, Days of Future Past, Apocalypse. apocalypse almost forgot that of apocalypse and then, and then <laughs> and then dark phoenix um and then last but not least we'll round out this podcast series with a recap and revisit of deadpool one and two um no fan for stick well i was just about to get to that conspicuous <laughs> by their absence um 2015's fan for stick and also 2020s the new mutants um oh we're not, we. we're not gonna be covering those we're not talking about those um <laughs> oh, first and foremost i think we briefly talked about the new mutants when it finally did arrive when mm -hmm. it when it, when it landed in in that weird covid period it was just such a strange time i think we briefly might have mentioned it but i just don't see any connections to anything that's moving forward especially in deadpool and wolverine and I think a very similar situation with uh, with Fant Forstick, with Michael B. Jordan, Miles Teller, so on and so forth. That movie is uh, it's an outlier. It's a complete outlier. Yeah, it, it just feels like there's no need to really talk about it. We might, I'm mm -hmm. sure, have some points about it in our Fantastic Four episode of, of those first two movies, but it's not going to get its own section, believe me. But um, yeah, man. With all of that said, with with the schedule outline and what we're going to be doing here for the next few weeks or so, I mean, what. What are your thoughts just about this era of filmmaking? Again, as I said, 20 years is a, is a really long time. It's only just it in the is. past couple of years that things have changed. Obviously, no, we know Disney ended up buying 20th Century Fox, acquiring a lot of those assets, returning back to Marvel. And so um, for the longest time, they were the biggest provider of Marvel mm -hmm. films um, before Marvel Studios really launched with Iron Man. So. What do you just think about just this era of filmmaking? And then, of course, us covering this for the next few weeks and how it might all tie into Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah, the this 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 era of filmmaking is so interesting because it did do so much, um, you know, with, like Blade kind of led into all of this. And I think thinking about how X-Men did kind of start the team up superhero thing, right? Blades by itself. Even Spider-Man comes out after X-Men 1. It's by itself. You know, I mean, Spider-Man is by himself. This is like... Without X-Men starting in 2000, without this era of filmmaking, to be honest, I'm not even sure what the MCU looks like. I'm not sure what, what the Batman, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies look like. You know what I mean? There's a lot of influence that happens in this era of filmmaking. And it's so interesting because when you go back and watch them, they do, they feel so, uh, they, a lot of them feel gritty in a way. A lot of them feel like a little darker, kind of than I remember, right? Especially because now in the MCU, things are somewhat lighter in the mcu right there's a lot, lot more jokes uh don't get me wrong there's some jokes and even x-men that i do want to point out and talk about later but like it's it's a lot of a lot of dark stuff going on people are dying in these movies cities are in peril like this it's kind of a crazy moment um but also when you think about the time period this this is all 9 11 ish you know what i mean like there's there's uh, there's a lot of darkness in the world as well and i think a lot of people looked to this era of filmmaking in these movies for levity. They look to this era of filmmaking too for the escapism that was happening in the world at the time. We are at war in Afghanistan at this time. You know, there's just so much going down. And so it's 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 a really cool moment of filmmaking, I think, to me, to look back, to look back on. And I think, you know, when when we get to Deadpool and Wolverine, I'm I'm very excited to see I think it, you know, we talk about Logan is like a send off, and I think it is for sure. But this, this Deadpool Wolverine is like send off part two. I think is what we're going to get to this era of filmmaking. But even more than the send off, that love letter, man, we've been getting a lot of those love letters recently in cinema. You know, I feel like No Way Home is a love letter to all things Spider Man, and I feel like Deadpool and Wolverine is going to be the same for these Fox movies for what they gave us and what they entail. Uh, and so, man, I, I, I even think about how this era of filmmaking kind of uh, uh, propelled, to be honest, some of the experience that we get in theme parks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like how we how we felt, how I felt going to Universal Studios and seeing Wolverine and Storm on walls 
was an era you know that was a time it's still there but you know none of none of that feels the same anymore <laughs> but it's it, it's still there and i think um I, I i really like how significant this this period was um especially thinking about i actually had some of these on like psp like on like you put you get you buy it from psp and you put it in psp and it plays and it's like what the heck i just couldn't it's just crazy to imagine uh that time period man so yeah i'm just very excited to get into it um and i think i think deadpool and wolverine will be uh, a, a really good send-off for the films we're going to talk about these next couple of weeks listen uh Wow, for 20 years here, we were getting films left and right, again, as I said, from multiple franchises, and it was a roller coaster of emotions for all 20 years. Sometimes they would be really good. Sometimes they would be damn near certifiable classics. Other times you would want to cover your eyes like, oh, my God, what did they do <laughs> to some of my favorite characters? What What's happening here? Um, mm -hmm. This was obviously a huge learning period for i think everybody involved this this hadn't really been done to this degree before we really only had prior to the 21st century superman and batman in live action that was really it marvel mm -hmm. had tried a couple of characters in live action in like the late 80s early 90s there's like a truly terrible captain america movie there's an awful fantastic four movie there's a mm -hmm. punisher movie with dolph lundgren like these things there damn near <laughs> non-existent they're like tv movies but now on the big screen, uh, we reached a point in the 21st century where technology had finally caught up to the ambitions of what comic book artists had been drawing and illustrating and sketching for, I think, three or four decades at that point in Marvel Comics. Now we were at a place where the resources were available to bring these characters to life, to tell these stories. But most importantly, what we, what we would be certainly remiss not to mention here, and it's, it's appropriate just due to the timing, none of this would even be possible if it weren't for X-Men, the animated series in the 90s mm. and the popularity of that show, that's really what kickstarted the desire on the part of film executives to say like, oh, wow, there's a really dedicated audience that wants to come and see this and, and have these characters portrayed on the big screen. Like, can we figure out a way to adapt that story and to adapt those characters onto the silver screen, which leads to X-Men? And as you said, there was Blade that was in place before, but... I mean, Blade mm -hmm. is also such a just an interesting outlier because he is a relatively unknown character at that time compared to For some sure. of these more big name characters that we would see, like a Wolverine and Storm, who had gained a lot of popularity through the animated series. And so mm -hmm. those film executives pointing that out, taking note of that, because that was on Fox Kids, of course, and then figuring out a way to bring this to live action is just such an interesting and important moment for superhero movies. And also the fact that, at this time, in 2000, when X-Men co comes out and kicks all of this off, this is on the heels of quite possibly the most disastrous moment for the character of Batman in history. Batman mm. and Robin had come out in 1997, Ooh, I believe, and <laughs> almost killed the character entirely, right? And so you talked about the Batman movies and Chris Nolan and being able to do what he did. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be able to happen if we don't at least see some proof of concepts, exactly. a bit of momentum gained on the part of these X-Men movies, obviously the Spider-Man movies that would come from Sony and some of the other films that would follow thereafter. But we were at a place where it's like, yeah, we had a couple of good things. X-Men, the animated series was super cool. There were other animated shows and cartoons that were on that, that, that had their fan bases. But from a movie going standpoint, it was a really tough time. Blade mm -hmm. was like the small glimmer of hope, like, OK, yeah. it made just enough, you know, it's modest success proved that there was just enough of an appetite to try to adapt more of these things. And then, as we know, and as we're going to get into for the next few weeks, this set off a chain of events that led to a lot of great moments, but also led to a lot of very, very bad moments that we certainly cannot ignore and that we will actively address throughout the course of this uh, this podcast series. But that means that we have to start off with the X-Men original trilogy because that really set in motion everything. As I said, we're going to get to all those other properties, but this original X-Men trilogy from 2000 to 2006, a really, really significant time in, mm -hmm. in the history of Hollywood. It was really the first major Marvel release to achieve mainstream success. Blade did okay, but this mm -hmm. is the movie that allowed them to cross over, you know, kickstarting a franchise that did last 20 years, 13 films came out of it, and overall grossed $6 billion worldwide at the global box office. So it's the 10th highest grossing film franchise of all time, which is interesting to say that out loud, because I think a lot of people look back on these movies like, ah, man, 
Fox didn't do that great with these movies, and 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 I want them to go back to Marvel. I want the rights to revert back to Marvel, and we want mm-hmm. Marvel Studios and the MCU's version of X Men, which totally get that. You know, I want that inter- interconnectivity, but these films were successful, even were. even even if they didn't always hit, they made mm-hmm. money. So, what's your thoughts on that? Because I think sometimes we we get in these periods and these moments of sometimes having a little bit of revisionist history and looking back on things because they're not in the immediate moment and saying like, oh well. You know, I might have liked it at that time, but it really wasn't all that great. When in reality, like people showed up for these things, they were hugely popular, and for a long time, they were kind of the only products out of movie going for superheroes that we were even getting in that in that particular era. Yeah, I think people tend to forget where we come from sometimes, or like what the beginnings really meant. You know, for us as uh, uh, f- comic book film goers, you know what I mean? Like there, uh, there is something about. Um, you know, recency bias. You talk about it all the time. And I'm not saying what we have now isn't great. It is. Or, you know, at least it was. But, you know what I'm saying? But we 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 forget, like, the life we lived back then. Like, I'm again, I just remember very vividly, you know, every the, when X-Men came out, how it felt for us in, in the event that we made it. And so I, I, think, I, I think some people, a lot of people like to remember the bad. And that happens a lot, right? Like that's a might be like a human condition thing, but a lot of times if something is bad, if something's like ten percent bad and ninety percent good, the ten percent bad tends to stay in our mind a little bit more than a ninety percent good. And I think that's what happens with this early, these early Fox movies is everybody assumes like thinking about it, like oh man, I didn't like that thing. That means to mean all the things were bad, and that's not true at all. Everything wasn't bad. Sure, bad moments. Shoot, the MCU got bad moments. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but uh, uh, it's it's really harping on that on that bad. I think that people tend to have comic book amnesia, comic book movie amnesia, and that is just simply not the case. So yeah, it's 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 uh, sometimes it does take jogging of memory though, which is a fun exercise for us, right? Like we're about to get back into these movies and maybe people will reminisce and, and remember things differently when we recall some of these things and be like, man, I don't remember it like that, but maybe that was a kind of a cool thing or yeah, I remember that bad thing that happened. And so I, I, I really like this exercise because I think it'll definitely help exactly what you're talking about. It, you know, what's also interesting about that too, is that the the bar has to be shifted and we have to take that into context as well, because at that time, when something came out and maybe it was bad or we perceived it to be bad, it was one of like a few options that we had. Now there's like mm-hmm. infinite amount of options. And so the scales of what can be good to what can be bad has drastically widened. Mm-hmm. And we've seen some truly atrocious shit come out over the course of this entire time frame. So much so that I look back on certain films that we're even going to talk about today and I'm like, it wasn't that bad if we're really being honest about it like of course bad choices were made some questionable yeah. things happened <laughs> yeah i'm like is it really that bad and and, mm-hmm. and 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 i don't know if that's the case that that's what we're here to you know sort of litigate and talk about um how do you feel about that moment though like coming out of batman and robin i mean we were young I, even me myself yeah. just like admittedly the first few times that I saw Batman and Robin, I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. It was, it was fine to me as a kid. Like I didn't have really a context or a thought or an idea about quality and the fact that they pretty much made that a two hour commercial because they were just trying to sell toys. But as you, as you, you know, think about the time that you were or or, or the Mm -hmm. age that you were at that time to, to how your knowledge of film has progressed and to also just how you look back on these things. I mean, how do you think about, and, and how do you recollect, though, those moments, those, I think, few scary years that a lot of people probably went through where it was like, you know, we don't know if this is ever really going to pop off, especially because it felt like it was a niche thing. It felt like that only a few people were really into comic books or superheroes mm-hmm. or any of this stuff. It wasn't the massive mainstream thing that it is now. And so we were actively thinking about and talking about, like, we may never get an Avengers movie. We may never get a Justice League movie. We mm-hmm. may never ever see any of this stuff come to light, come to see the light of day because there's not enough of an audience to actually want to show up and pay for to f- pay for the movies to to go see them. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of in the boat of I was just young, so anything that came up, I was happy about. I was like very grateful <laughs> for anything that was on the screen. Uh and, and what's funny in, in in remembering I guess quality of some of these movies to be honest, now now that I think about it, it's more like how much I love one thing over the other. Like, of course, I love the X-Men films, right? But now I'm thinking like, man, I probably watched Spider-Man more than I watched X-Men in that time. You know what I mean? Like, at least X1 uh, to a degree. And so that's kind of in my in back of my head. That's kind of like 
my cinematic maturity of like, huh, that makes sense that <laughs> I would feel that way if, you know, c- given the, some of the critical statuses of the, of these movies. And, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of been fun to, to rectify my brain of, of me being so young, how I felt like, is this, did, did I, was there ever a time where I was like, dang, this movie sucks. You know what I'm saying? I'm not sure I ever mm-hmm. was ever really in that boat. As you talk about Batman and Robin, shoot, bro. I thought Iceman or not Iceman, but uh, Mr. Freeze was the coolest thing, bro. <laughs> which I do still think they knocked that character design out of the park. Like that, I think it's like it one of the cool coolest design. parts of the movie. Yeah. It's a very good design. They really beasted that. Um, but I, I think I thought the campiness was normal though, too. Because at that again mm. at that time there wasn't much to go off of mm. like that was it when Batman Robin came out I was like well I guess it's supposed to be like this it, in my mind in my mind that's comic booky you know what I'm saying when you see that when you're younger you're like oh shoot this is crazy out of out of ridiculous but that's all I knew and so I thought it was I thought it was cool then and so um, X Men going back and looking at it again we'll talk about it but you know some things it's like hmm I see why you did that given the time. But now it's like, dang, why didn't you try this? Or why didn't you try that? Or, you know, so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's it's, it's a very interesting experience when you look back on some of these things. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to step on, you know, what we'll get into later. But but certainly the the backlash against Batman and Rob Robin for a lot of the creative choices they that they made in terms of tone, in terms of costume mm-hmm. design, cinematography, all of those things it clearly affected how they develop X-Men because yeah. they, mm-hmm. they go for the most they grounded the opposite. approach possible <laughs> and go the complete opposite direction. But we'll, we'll get into that for sure. Um, man, when you think about these three films, 2000 to 2006, uh, that, that is a, a crazy point in time. I was transitioning from middle school about to leave middle school and go into high school. So 2000 and 2006, I was, I was between elementary. I, I was between the year and I'm dating myself, obviously, but between the years of uh, being eight years old and 14 years old. Yeah. 14 years old. I think at that, po- at that particular mm-hmm. like era of my life. Um, and, and also just like pop culture wise, things were, were drastically different. You know, there was no streaming social media didn't exist. The internet was, you know, starting to really, really become like a, a, a big thing in blogs and chat rooms and stuff like that, but it mm-hmm. hadn't blown up to the degree that we know it would. Um, and theatrical movie going was also still, I think the central figure point of our culture, like that was still like the most culturally significant thing you can do in terms of entertainment. Now there's, you know, so many distractions, social media, video games, all sorts of stuff Mm -hmm. that occupy people's time. What do you remember just about these movies when they released and and, and your experience with them? Did you see them in theaters? How much did you watch them on television cable? If that, if that were the case, I know you brought up the PSP moment earlier. That was, that was a thing like with physical media where it's like you had the little mini disc, um, did you own them on other formats, DVD, VHS? Like, what, what's your relationship just with, like, the the, the ro- rollout and release of these movies at that particular time? Yeah, so a, a lot of my nerdum comes from my cousins, uh, just being around them. I was the baby at the time. There's one more younger than me, little cousin. She was born in 2000. <laughs> so at that time, I'm still pretty much, you know, the baby. And so everything, we we, we literally make a, a, a big thing to go to the movies as a unit, depending on what it is. And a lot of times uh, we we went to go see X-Men movies in particular, and we went to go see Lord of the Rings movies in particular. Those are like just our thing. I don't I don't know where it came from. Again, I'm too young to remember why we did it, but that's where a lot of my nerdum comes from. And so uh, it, it was an event to go see these X-Men movies, especially, again, X1 was so fresh and new. When X2 came out, it was like, oh, we going to the movies, you know what I'm saying? Like it was it was a good time kind of to be alive, knowing that the X-Men was around the corner. Uh, and so I d- absolutely seen it in theaters. I, what's crazy to think about is how, I guess, blessed I was to I just be in a, in a around a group of people who wanted to go to the movies to see these. Like a lot of people today can't say they seen Spider Man in theaters, X Men One, X Men Two in theaters. Shoot, Batman Begins. You know what I'm saying? Like I feel very blessed to again just have been around those people to have experienced that. But that was definitely my experience. I seen them in theaters, and it was a it was a good time. Oh, Star Wars too. It was, uh, Lord of the Rings, X Men, and Star Wars, um, which is kind of crazy that we had all of those things coming out at the same time. Like once the twenty first century kicked off, we were getting yeah. a Star Wars movie every three years. Lord of the Rings popped out, you know, every single year. Those first three, the X Men movies, the Spider Man movie. I mean, this this all it's not a coincidence, but it, it mm-hmm. ties into the globalization and the franchising that Hollywood really made a priority in the twenty first century. I think that they saw oh, wow, this is the next wave. We need to have big IP. We need to have franchises that, you know, if you look at the, glo- the global box office 
since 2000 and look at the, mm -hmm. the top grossing movies, I think at least like 98, 99% of them come from the 21st century because that's where things kicked mm. off. You know, it's, it's, crazy. it's those movies you mentioned. It's, it's the Shrek mm. films, which change animation. Yeah. Um, it, it's a lot. Harry Potter, of course, is in there. So it, it was a big time where I think we started, we started to see more people actively go to the movies because you had those big cultural event mm. moments that, that would happen over the course. Like one would come out in May, then the next one's July. Then, you know, November and December are going to be big too. So you kind of spread out the, 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 the time and opportunity to go visit the movies. Yeah, which is so like I can't even imagine if that like that boom didn't happen. You know what I mean? I think that was also a moment where just nerdum in general was becoming more popularized. I wouldn't call it mainstream. I, you know, I think there's a difference between popular and mainstream, but definitely more popularized. Like you could maybe go to school and you would know somebody like, oh yeah, I seen X Men or oh I seen this thing. So yeah. I really, I really love like just thinking about that boom in that time period because again, all of those things are at the same time, and I think that also helped form us. You know what I'm saying? This podcast is like that time period is crazy. Uh, but whatever year it is after, because I was born in '94, that's what grade I was in. So if it's 2000, I was probably in kindergarten 2001 is first grade 2002 is second grade like that's literally how it works for me um so this time period literally is like the course of my elementary school days uh and so i was very impressionable at that time but uh again i absolutely owned you know physical media my mom would randomly buy dvds uh we had a bunch of vhs's for sure but this is like the transition to dvd right this is a lot of this is dvd time um and what's funny about this is I technically did not have X1 and 2 on DVD. My mom only bought The Last Sand. I don't know why that is. So to be honest, out of all these movies we're going to talk about today, I've probably seen The Last Sand more than all of them. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> that is so crazy to yeah. me. Um, and, and so I have a slightly different relationship with it. I just know, like I, in my rewatch, I was like knowing the words. I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> I know the words to a lot of this movie more than X1 and X2. It was crazy. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely uh own that that, that that physical media um in that way and again that psp man you, i would throw in uh, uh after a while they like came out with older movies so i would throw in uh x2 with my psp on a bus ride to school it's so crazy and ridiculous but it is what it is but yeah man that was that was kind of my relationship yeah we uh to to, to your point about um you know w what was available to what you could watch i mean we we weren't binging things at that time like you didn't have no. just like 10 things on a streaming service that you can just watch over the course of a couple of days like this is before you go on netflix and everything is just next to each other in a tile it's like mm -hmm. you watch the movies that you had and you probably exactly if you were lucky <laughs> most families probably kept like maybe like 15 or 20 movies but mm -hmm. if you had like a family member that did collect and did like occasionally buy stuff my mom did the same thing she would just like buy movies and that's where it all started she and i noticed like at a young age like you buy more movies than other people like same, i go to other people's yeah. houses and they don't have <laughs> as many movies as we have and so I'm, I'm actively consuming this stuff a lot more but um from a theatrical standpoint um i, I was fortunate enough to see all these in theaters um, my mom took me to all of them when they came out but i remember specifically X1 is a bit of a, you know, foggy sort of recollection, but but mm -hmm. X-Men 2, I remember very vividly because what happened yep. to me that day was actually something that was ingrained in my mind for a very long time. I still feel like I suffered like some traumatic, like, you know, outbursts from it or whatever the case may be. But I remember the local mall near my home, uh, the Jamestown Mall, which is, you know, no longer in existence. Uh, they had a movie theater, Warrenburg Theaters, which is like now Marcus Theaters. It's, it's a just a crazy thing to re recollect. But we went to go see it at that movie theater, which we saw a lot of our movies at. And I remember this is before, you know, there was online booking, reserve seating, that 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 did not exist. Like you had to show up. And if you wanted mm -hmm. to show up to a big movie and make sure that you got inside, you probably would have to show up early. And we did show up early. It was like an afternoon showing on a Friday, maybe like three or four o'clock or something like that. Or it might've might been a Saturday because mm -hmm. it was still school time. We show up, we get in line. The line is really long and we get to like the midway point of the line the showing sells out and i'm like devastated i'm like there's no way i cannot see this movie i'm just like really really hurt by it not thinking and not processing the fact that like okay we could just kind of kill some time and go to a later showing like i hadn't even like registered in that my that in my mind because i was just like devastated that i, I might not be able to see this movie because i was anticipating it so much um mm -hmm. we did end up seeing the movie that same day we just like killed some time in the in the mall for for a couple of hours and it was great it was a great time and uh i remember that specifically because i'm just like Oh yeah, I gotta show up to movies early if I'm trying to make sure I'm seeing them. I cannot, I cannot <laughs> yeah. go through this again. Like I want to mm -hmm. make sure that I'm there as long as you know that was still in effect where you couldn't reserve seats. Obviously, that 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 was still like a thing 
that kept through the 2000s and the 2010s even. Um, yeah. But I also had um, the first one on VHS, which mm -hmm. is, you know, even crazy to think about. And I think it's still like back home somewhere. Um, and X2, I don't think I ever owned until I got older. I, I don't think I had any copy of that. And then X3, I also had on DVD. That was the one that was like, I got a DVD copy of that. Um, I think like 05 and 06 are like the biggest years for DVD ever. For DVDs? I yeah, think, I I think, think so. when you look at the stats and you look at the numbers mm -hmm. and the amount of money, I think like 06 or 05, one of those years, more DVDs have been sold than ever. So there might be a correlation there. But um, yeah, man, it just, you know, it, 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 it developed that relationship across time, you know, with these movies. You know, you, you just see them and you watch them. And you have these experiences. And like you said, you would go talk about them with friends if you had a friend group that was into this stuff. And, and, and it really just kind of created this, I think, snowball effect to where the cultural conversation around expectations and the movie and the stories that they would adapt and mm -hmm. the characters and their outcomes was also like super important. And what I think is the most important thing to remember as we get into this conversation is the is the fact that this was the first time for a superhero property that we ever got a true trilogy of films that had never happened before. The mm. Superman movies that came out in the 70s, 70s and the 80s, they made four of those. It wasn't even a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you watch three and four these days, they feel so differently than the first two. They are extremely different movies. And those Batman films, they didn't design that to be a trilogy. They were just going to keep making them. And they recast, and you have Val Kilmer come in after Michael Keaton. George Clooney comes in. Like, they had no intentions mm -hmm. of doing an isolated, contained story. The X-Men films, X-Men, X2, and then X-Men The Last Stand, was the first time we had ever gotten a trilogy of superhero films. They beat Spider-Man to the punch, of course, who would then yes. conclude that Tobey Maguire trilogy one year later after The Last Stand, but... Do you remember like any thoughts or, 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 you know, sort of, I guess, memories of, of that being a conversation when the last stand came around in particular, because they certainly, I remember marketed it as potentially the final X-Men film. Like we were, mm -hmm. we were kind of expecting this to be the end of it. We know that that's not the case, obviously, and they would make a lot more, but it did feel like it was the end of an era and that this particular set of cast members were probably going to go away, if not forever, at least for a while until they figured out what a new direction was going to be. No, I absolutely remember that. The title of the movie was like everything to me, right? Because it's just X1, X2, X-Men 3, The Last Stand. You're like, what? The last what? What are you saying to me right now? And I think, I do think at the time, I, I did have hope that something else would happen. I didn't think it would be X-Men. I don't know what I thought <laughs> it was at the time. But I do, again, vividly remember like, man, this is going to be the end. And I remember poking my mom like, Mom, you got to take me. I'm sorry. This is this 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 might be it. This might be the end of the road. We can't we can't not go to this one because I think I had missed some other superhero movie. I forgot what it was. It wasn't an X Men. It wasn't a Spider Man. It was something else. I had missed. And I was like, we can't miss this one. We really can't. Uh, but that's really all I remember to be honest. Uh, I just remember it kind of that those expectations of like we just got to go to the theater. Like you, there's no other choice. This is the end of an era or the end of of the, what these movies in a time and we and we have to go and, and uh i still ended up going with my cousin she was like yeah go ahead here's the money <laughs> you know she would give me money to go to, to the movies with them but man it was like a it, it, it was a little scary then because it, these are again my formative years of becoming a true comic book nerd right and i'm like oh yeah no we 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 can't let this one go by the wayside so yeah that's what i remember yeah, I, I actively remember in the lead up to that movie, The Last Stand, there being a conversation and an anticipation and a hope and desire that they would nail the ending. Like they have to conclude this in a really satisfying way, especially because mm. X2 was was pretty beloved at that time. You know, it was it was a really successful film. A lot of people said like it, it was far superior to the first one. So now mm -hmm. the, the 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 bar has been raised and this last one has to has to do something pretty phenomenal. And we, we can't, you know, forget to mention that they actively teased the Dark Phoenix story at the end of two, you know, four, mm -hmm. three. And so if you knew anything about that story and the consequences and how significant it could be, right. we also walked into it with those expectations on how they were going to play that out. And, 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 and I think that that was definitely a sticking point. For a lot of conversations I remember having, even as a young as a young guy at that point, just thinking like with friends and and other people who wanted to see these things like, oh, this this is going to be important that they get it right. And and I hope that it's good. I just hope that it's good. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk about whether or not it's good. But um, let's dive into this uh, this first movie, X-Men that came out in 2000, as we know 
kickstarted a completely new revolution, I think, of comic book films, comic book media, really. And um, overall, this film, looking back on it and rewatching it now, especially mm -hmm. comparing it to memories of what I remember about it, it's a pretty simple and basic film. Like, it's a yeah. really simple formula formula of a film like they don't they don't do anything that's all that complicated i think the approach here was to was to just have a really solid introduction for a lot of these characters mm -hmm. but um this movie had been in devel development for for a long time you know there was a lot of interest there again from the x-men the animated series and so they had been working on this all throughout the 90s and and once we started talking about who's going to direct it who's going to be a part of it um at one point the studio fox they had considered brett ragnar as a director um he he would ultimately go on to direct x-men the last stand but then they offered the position to robert rodriguez at that time but he ended up turning it down i think robert rodriguez was coming off of maybe from dust till dawn at that particular mm. point i think that that movie came out around this era around 97 or 98 quentin tarantino mm. wrote that movie um i don't know how a robert rodriguez x-men movie would have been it sounds he interesting by kids he did so, i mean yeah that and that's pretty close superhero ish that is, yeah yes. there, there's definitely some dna there and and we've seen i think throughout the course of his career he has an interest in in a lot of genre storytelling um, True. They also offered the movie to Paul W.S. Anderson, not not to be confused with PTA, Paul Thomas Anderson, yeah, different person, <laughs> different person, definitely. Um, and, and different films for sure. But Paul definitely W. Different films. <laughs> Paul W.S. Anderson uh, was coming off of the Mortal Kombat movie that came out in the mid 90s. Oh, which, thank uh, God we give it to him. Lord I, Jesus. Yeah, that 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 would have been um that would have also been a choice that probably would have let them down a, a completely different direction because that Mortal Kombat movie. I look back on it fondly, but um. I don't know. Yeah, if the Horizon, a right? The yeah. Horizon was good. I like the Horizon. Yeah, yeah. Event Horizon yeah. was, yeah, but was still, good. like 2002 is like Resident Evil. Yeah, I'm just glad it wasn't him. I'm yeah, glad it, wasn't him. it just doesn't feel like from a from a writing standpoint, it would have been what it needed to be. Like visually, mm -hmm. I think he could have you know been up to par for, but from a, a, a characterization standpoint. I don't know, but he eventually, you know, he shifted away from it. Um, but then, of course, the usual suspects, which uh, which came out in '95, in which is you know a phenomenal movie, which was directed by Brian Singer. Um, he was looking to do something in the science fiction realm, and Fox had offered him the Alien Resurrection movie, but his producing partner Tom DeSanto uh, felt that he would actually be more appropriate for X Men, um, and he was kind of hesitant to take this property on. But ultimately, his mind had been changed after DeSanto sort of pitched him the themes of what X-Men are, just these themes mm -hmm. of prejudice and, and racism and, and supremacy and the government politics, all of the really intricate things that we know to be associated with X-Men stories and characters um, that ultimately resonated with Brian Singer. And he, he, he eventually, you know, decided to commit to the project and be the director as we know, and, and not only the director for the first two, but he would return to the studio later and direct more feature films for them in this X-Men franchise. Um, we're going to, I think I think we certainly have to we have to reckon with the legacy of Brian Singer. There, there's you know quite a bit yeah. to talk about there. Uh, I think we'll table that for now and get back to it. Um, I want to talk about some of these castings because uh, that's obviously important. Um, Wolverine that was a big big priority for them. Um, Russell Crowe was his first choice. Was Brian Singer's first choice to play Wolverine, mm -hmm. um, but he turned it down. Which I think good move on the part of Russell Crowe. I don't move. I don't see that as a fit I for him. See it. Um, nope. He's obviously a great actor, but he yeah. He, he got a little woofiness to him. A little he bit. A little, little bit. A little woofiness to him. Yeah. Um, and at that particular time, too, he was, you know, starting to enter into a, a, a very prime era for him. I don't know, you know, if if in thinking about his career and his trajectory, you know, in 2000, he makes Gladiator. He probably doesn't get the chance to make mm -hmm. that if he has to film X-Men. Then he makes mm -hmm. um, A Beautiful Mind. Mm -hmm. And then he does, you know, Cinderella Man eventually. And he does, like, all of these uh, Master and Commander. He has a lot of movies that, that really catapult him to being an A-plus list superstar in Hollywood. Yeah. But if he had committed to X-Men, I'm sure he would have obviously been super famous because of that, because of the character mm -hmm. of Wolverine. They focused on him, but would have just been a completely different type of career altogether. Um, but he recommended Hugh Jackman, who, were, who was friends with him at the time. Hugh Jackman was an unknown guy. Like, nobody knew him. Nobody knew who yep. Hugh Jackman was. He didn't have a ton of experience. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't experience... He was Russell Crowe's friend, right? Yeah, yeah. They were, they, like they they were, definitely, they were yeah. definitely buddies, but I didn't know this at the time because I wasn't on the internet, but apparently... A lot of historical research shows that there was just like outrage towards the casting of Hugh Jackman. Like people were mm. upset, pissed, and just like 
what? This doesn't make sense. He physically doesn't fit the bill because Wolverine is typically a shorter character. Um, you know, he's also not an American. He's an Australian. And so people, I think, had some hangups about that. There was just a lot of conversation <laughs> around Hugh Jackman. Like, who is this guy? He was mostly a yeah. theater, a theater performer. You know, who, who are they getting yeah. in to come to play this really beloved character? Um, well, I mean, again, we were young when this when this decision was made, but it, it, it feels like that especially with comic book movies, there's always a lot of, um, I guess, jumping the gun when it comes to casting decisions. Like yeah. people have opinions really early. People had opinions about Ben Affleck as Batman. People had yeah. opinions about Heath Ledger as Joker. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like nine times out of 10 fans are typically proven wrong. That's what it feels yeah. like. Yeah. It does feel like that. Robert Pattinson, too, of course, mm -hmm. even more recently. Exactly. Was a was a big thing. And what also is so funny about all of those is all the movies they did before that were just more artsy, I guess, and more theater. And to me, that means they fit the bill even more because they're able to play so many different characters and bring something to the character they're set to play. But I think that's a real thing. Like people were like expecting maybe like action star like i really don't know what they're looking for at that time but all of those castings are like oh what is uh, uh hugh jackman gonna do he's a theater kid what's robert pattinson gonna do are we talking about the the guy from from uh new dawn uh what, twilight, oh, twilight we're talking yeah. about that guy mm -hmm. or are we talking about you know all of those Diggory. castings are just like eccentric Dick, like who it's fun. all of those castings are like that uh so it's really funny that you that you mentioned that because that is like a pattern i wonder if I wonder, like, the people who is a star or who are already kind of different kind of stars, if they ever get that pushback. But it seems like those castings always seem to be the biggest, though, too. Like, the artsy, more underground, you know, actors turn into the Batman or Wolverine. Or it's always them that it seems to be like that. It's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, these are multidimensional characters that require somebody to be mm -hmm. a really, really talented performer. To, to I mean, there's a lot of a lot of darkness and pain associated with the Wolverine character. You got to have somebody that can like bring that to life. Now, you know, that, that has to take place over the course of multiple movies, multiple years, all of that can right. be done in the first film. They're, they are taking a bet to a certain extent because there's only so much to go off of. But I think even more so when there's somebody who doesn't really have a track record, who doesn't have much of a resume, that even makes it more interesting to me. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. th this is a great showcase for them to just show what they're worth. And obviously as a casting director, as a director of the film itself, like if you see something so much in a person that you're willing to hire them based off of virtually no filmmaking or, 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 or star experience prior to that, I think it kind of says a lot about them as a performer. Mm -hmm. um, and we see paid off, obviously. Um, Viggo Mortensen was also in talks to play Wolverine, which uh, he ended up not doing it. He was in, you know, again, we're talking about this era. He was in the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. movies at this time. Yep. And so uh, that that would have obviously, I think, changed his commitment there. He goes on to play Aragorn in those movies um, and is a, a, a very respectable star in his own right, but but, but a really well-respected actor who had been around for a long time. Um, and also Doug Ray Scott was officially cast, but he had to drop out because uh, he was filming Mission Impossible 2. And Tom Cruise was like, you can't do this at the same time. We, we can't mm -hmm. we can't have you being in both of these movies. You need to you need to go out and drop out. Apparently, you know, the reason given was, you know, sustained injuries. But uh, he said that Tom Cruise, I think, kind of gave him the nudge like, no, you're doing my movie. You're not doing this comic book movie like get a, get away from that right now. <laughs> Uh, and so Jackman, Hugh Jackman was cast officially three weeks into the filming, you know, based on his uh, really successful the, audition. The last guy to get casted. Which is which is crazy to think about. That's like, so crazy. Um, the last person to he, get casted. He goes on to be the most important player in all of this, you know, but he was the last one on board. Uh, not the last one on board was Patrick Stewart, though. Uh, Patrick Stewart was pretty much the first choice for Brian Singer. He was approached on a movie that they did together, Conspiracy Theory. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that was directed by... Richard Donner, who produced it, um, who produced X-Men and also had history with superhero films, directed, you know, the, the first two Superman flicks. Patrick Stewart was was well known. You know, he, he had done all the Star Trek. Absolutely. Stuff. He had done the next yep. generation. He had done the movies. Um, he had a very, very long and respected career. So people knew who Patrick Stewart was. He was the biggest name at that particular point to join the cast, yeah. which if you notice, when you go back and look at these movies, he has top billing. You know, he is the first name mm -hmm. that you see. Um, I don't know how many people know this. Um, Michael Jackson actively campaigned to be Charles Xavier, uh, but allegedly he was <laughs> never seriously considered by the studio. Um, is this a real, th like, uh, 
how do we end up in places like this? It's just kind of crazy. Michael Jackson really thought that he was going to be Charles <laughs> Xavier. Uh, the story goes from Laura Shula Donner. She she recounts that, uh, you know, Xavier is an older white guy, right? And uh, apparently Michael <laughs> responded and said, oh, yeah, you know, I can wear makeup. That's no problem. And then he proceeded to show her his short film ghost, you know, where in that, in that short film, yeah. he has, um, he has prosthetics of a, of a, of a larger, heavier set white man in that movie. And, 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 you know, let's not forget to mention his, his skin had also lightened up at that point due to right. the, uh, the vitiligo that he was undergoing. Mm-hmm. But, um, Michael Jackson, Charles Xavier, is that a, is that a better movie or worse movie? What is, what does that even look like? <laughs> that movie is insane. Whatever movie that is. I'm pretty sure. Sh- is he singing? Does he sing into his X-Men? I hope not. In, I uh, hope not. Look, that is a crazy concept, a crazy idea. I can't even, I can't imagine him with anything, with makeup, with nothing. It's, it, it's definitely Teddy Perkins vibes. Like, <laughs> like for sure. He's Teddy. <laughs> That's exactly what it would have felt like. The voice, can you imagine him talking? Hey, Gene, I need you to, I need you, in, I need you in Storm to, uh, I can't, I can't. I just can't imagine. But it's funny because everyone always says Michael Jackson always hit his real voice. So I always like to think about like, what if he got to, got a role like that? And he was like a beast because he changed everything. Like he used his real voice, his acting voice. He wouldn't do that. But I just think that's a crazy concept. This is, that's so ridiculous, man. Uh, it's placing a lot of faith in him and his acting abilities. Um, <laughs> this is also a guy who at that particular point in his life, he was not like, he wasn't touching people. Like he wouldn't let people like shake his hand, hug it. Like, oh, yeah. It was very much like, he is a distant figure off, mm-hmm. off in the in, in in the unknown almost. I mean, he had become really a mystical kind of presence just based on his entire life. Uh yeah. the fact that he like actively lobbied for this, I just that that, that is um that's quite interesting. But <laughs> what what is even more ironic about it is that his younger sister, Janet Jackson, was actually offered the role of Storm. Like this wasn't a joke. She didn't campaign for it. They gave it to her, but she had to drop out because she had touring obligations. And she actually just talked about this even recently. Like I think a few mm-hmm. weeks ago, I saw stories come back up about her saying like, yeah, actually I was offered the role of Storm. That was going to be, that was going to be me in that movie, but I couldn't do it because wow. I was on tour at that point. We know it ultimately went to Halle Berry. Um, I'm, I'm gonna ask again: better movie, worse movie with Janet Jackson and Storm? I think, I think different than her brother. She had actually had some way acting, different. She had some acting yeah, credits hey. under her belt. Yeah, you know, yeah. she was she was doing a little bit more work on that front than than, than Michael was, for sure. And she was like, yeah, really like when whenever she was in something, it was like, oh yeah, a Janet Jackson movie. Like she's a decent actress actually. Uh, but I. Uh, <laughs> To be honest, uh, we'll talk about it later. Storm is so, like, left to the wayside. I'm not sure it would have been that much of a difference to me. You know what I mean? Like, they kind of feel similar in that way. Like, I feel like if Janet, maybe her trajectory would have been different as a as a person. But I think the movies might have kind of felt kind of similar and kind of the same. I think that's how I feel. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that they, in the movie they didn't provide enough characterization to, to, to mm. all of a sudden think that, like, if Janet Jackson had gotten the role, it would have been much more significant exactly. to the story. It always felt like that they were making sure who their focal points were. It was going to be, it was going to be professor X. It was going to be Magneto. It was going to be mm-hmm. Wolverine. Um, and they pivoted a couple of times here and there. Jean Grey obviously became super important in this franchise, but storm was always somewhat of a side character. Now, Halle mm-hmm. Berry, she did get some some increased screen time and opportunity because she won an Oscar in the midst of all of this. She won an Oscar for yeah. Monsters Ball. So the difference between one and two, you can see like, oh, she has more mm-hmm. lines, she has more to do. And then by three, she's a bona fide superstar. Like she is mm-hmm. she is pretty much the leader along with Logan at that point. So it's just always interesting to like account for that stuff, like how just everything changes. And that obviously has to be taken into consideration with the script. But uh, speaking of the script for this first one, um, Beast, Nightcrawler, Pyro, and the Danger Room were all included in the original draft of the script, but they had to be deleted because Fox said, we ain't got money for all of that. Like, y'all got to scale scale the fuck back. We're giving y'all $75 million, and that's it. Um, which is probably, I mean, it's probably a smart decision, right, to, like, not not overstuff this first one. Like, it is, it is going to be a lot of people's first introduction to these characters. And so, mm-hmm. you know, maybe the Danger Room would have been nice, but that does come back in three. But I, I feel like that it might have been somewhat of a responsible decision to say, like, we can't have too many characters here because we're going to confuse the audience because they have to really establish a relationship with the with the with the yeah. primary ones that we that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, I think that's a good decision. Um, you know, we see later on kind of how uh, it feels to focus 
um on, on those characters straight up and slowly introduce introduce characters over time felt right to me i, I think there's even like uh uh easter eggs to to uh beast and even a uh, gambit I think in in, yeah, in some yeah. of these, there and it's like, there. and it's like, whoa, where, where are these guys at? Um, but it it makes sense. Uh, I do like the idea of like, let's establish this small team because uh, you even kind of see that working for like first class. You know what I mean? Like, it's been first class. It's like, oh yeah, let's focus on these relationships in these people. Because um, what's funny, even in doing that with uh, the, the this first X Men film, there's still people that get left by the wayside. You know what I mean? There's still people whose story kind of get left out. So I I do like the decision. I think to kind of focus um on on certain things i don't know how i feel about like danger room because danger room we don't see nothing in the danger room till like x3 and it's like damn y'all waited this long to touch the danger room it's like all right but um i i, I do understand the the, the idea of kind of keeping those core uh the small uh group of core characters i think sure um in mid 1998 brian singer and tom DeSanto brought chris mccrory from the usual suspects um, and they did a rewrite on the script. Now we know uh, Christopher McQuarrie. He 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 won an Oscar for the Usual Suspects. Um, most people probably know him now for the Mission Impossible movies and the relationship he has mm -hmm. with Tom Cruise. Like he is a superstar director now, but at that time he was still somewhat of a no name. He had just been known for winning an Oscar, but he came on and did a rewrite of the script. But uh, also, Joss Whedon, a young Joss Whedon, was brought in during production to help rewrite the last act. Um, and he was apparently critical of the script and performed a major overhaul of what he had read at that point. His draft did indeed feature the Danger Room, and it also concluded with Jean Grey dressed as the Phoenix. And uh, according to mm. Entertainment Weekly, the screenplay was ultimately rejected because of its, quote, quick-witted pop culture referencing tone, end quote. Hmm, I wonder where we would see a Joss Whedon script that was quick-witted and pop culture referencing. Um, it sounds like the Avengers before the Avengers, does it That's not? That's too funny. Like, yeah, absolutely. I, were we, I guess were we just not ready for that? Like, because that is exactly what made the Avengers so successful when it came out, mm -hmm. was the fact that he took a lot of the, the tone and the energy of what Robert Downey Jr. had established with Tony Stark, that yep. quick-witted pop culture referencing tone, he then applied it to that group scenario and that dynamic. And we know, I mean, again, Joss Whedon is another one we probably have to reckon with as well. A lot of problematic young white guys in Hollywood at this point. But um, he, 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 he helped imbue them with a lot of the, the, the I guess, the human elements, the, the, the normal conversations, the funny conversations, you know, the really, the really witty stuff that we would see that would be kind of a trademark of the MCU. But I guess, I guess we just weren't ready for that type of tone and style in, in the early 2000s when we were getting this first X-Men movie. Yeah, that, which is so interesting because to me, Whedon was just, he sounded like he was trying to make a comic book movie. You know what I mean? Because the comics, there's a lot of jokes in comics. Like people are, you laugh oh, all the ton, time. Like yeah. every other page is a joke and you're going to laugh. And it seems like that's what Josh Whedon was trying to do. But maybe you're, I, maybe we weren't ready for that, especially talking about uh, how part of this did come from one, trying to be the kind of the opposite of Batman and Robin. It's too much going on. And also seeing a little bit of the success of how Blade went. Blade is, like, not funny at all. Yeah, no. <laughs> and it was semi-successful, right? And it's like, well, that's a little crazy. That Phoenix costume, Batman with nipples, you know, it's too much. It might be too, <laughs> it might, it might be too much at the time. But uh, it, it is interesting, though, because I do think you there are a little bit of quick-witted things between Cyclops and, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, Wolverine, Wolverine yeah. in the movie. Yeah, they have some. And so there, there, there's some stuff in there, but I, I absolutely know what they mean. Like, it's not the crux of the movie. It stands out, actually, because it happens not that often. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, shoot, I remember that. He's like, are you the real... But I don't know. You're the real one. You're an asshole. Oh, you know what I'm saying? It's like, ah, that's funny. So it's like, yeah, it's just a, it's a really interesting uh, way to think about things in the history of of where this quick wittedness comes from. Yeah, I get he was just, you know, he was just 12 years too early, really, at this point. Like you said, I think he was just trying to make it feel like a comic book. And, and, and mm -hmm. he was an avid comic book reader and he had been doing stuff with Buffy at this point, of course, and would eventually take on Serenity. So he had gathered a fan base from running these shows and dealing with these big casts and dealing mm -hmm. with ensemble casts. And that's what made him a really, really strong choice to ultimately direct the Avengers. But it's just crazy. Like, this is what he tried to crazy. make this movie. Um, and it was rejected. And then ultimately, he was able to still, like, have that same sensibility and bring it to the Avengers. That story tells itself, obviously. Um, this movie came out, as, as I mentioned earlier, had a production budget of $75 million at that particular time, which is also just, like, 
just weird because no comic book movie costs this least amount of money anymore. Like everything is uber expensive. Um, but it was super successful at the U.S. and Canadian box office. It made one hundred and fifty seven million dollars in international territories, an additional one hundred and thirty nine million dollars for a worldwide total of two hundred and ninety six point three million dollars, which placed it in the top 10 highest grossing movies of that year. Let me uh, read off this top 10 for you. Um, at number 10 was What Lies Beneath. Nine was X-Men. Eight was The Perfect Storm. Seven, wow. Meet the Parents. Six, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the one with Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. Number five, Dinosaur, that, that movie from Disney. Mm -hmm. Four, What Women Want. Three, Castaway. Two, Gladiator, starring Russell Crowe. And one, Mission Impossible 2. Um... This is a strange list to look at. This this is this is blowing my mind, honestly, to look at this because yeah. the top ten here, there's only one sequel, like literally just one sequel in this list uh, in the top ten, and that's Mission Impossible Two. Everything else is original and 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 semi original, like How the Grinch Stole Christmas is it, it's definitely IP, but there was no live right. action movie. It was just like the, the VHS 15 minute short that came out. There was really nothing, mm -hmm. nothing around that uh, dinosaur. There's just the Disney brand behind that, but everything else is original. Meet the parents is a comedy. What lies beneath a horror movie, the perfect storm, a disaster movie. What women want a, a rom-com cast away, a star vehicle for Tom Hanks gladiator, a historical epic. You would never see this today. Like this would not be the top 10 in 2024. Like it's kind of crazy how different things are because you only have one superhero movie in this list and everything else is just original ideas. And we know that in the few short years, as we talked about earlier, things would drastically change after this. Yeah. It's so weird to look at like, Whoa, this was the top 10. First of all, I could not imagine mission impossible anymore ever being the number one movie of any year oh, you know no. it's no way. it's like what <laughs> it, it's huge but to to yeah to, it, it couldn't make that much money to be at the top spot of the box office it's insane to even imagine not only that but like it's some even looking at like a movie like meet the parents which is very it's very comedic right it's a lot of it's a lot of laughing kind of a uh just a family drama but it's like also off the hinges a little bit. I also just couldn't even imagine that being top 10 today either. Uh, just what a weird landscape. So some of uh, the one, uh, uh, I kind of understand dinosaur. Dinosaur was a phenomenon when it came out. Everyone was like, what the hell is this movie? And like, nobody it, talks about it anymore at all. That's the crazy so thing about it. Nobody really weird, ever talks about dinosaur. But I it's so crazy because I remember it coming out and being like, whoa, what is this technology they're using in this movie? Like, mm -hmm. what is going on here? It was like legit a big deal when Dinosaur came out. Like you said, nobody talks about it anymore. But I very vividly remember how like it shook. <laughs> it kind of shook people a little bit when it came out because it was that crazy. And then the Grinch just went crazy when it came out. It was just it was just one of those like lightning in a bottle kind of type movies, man. But yeah, this landscape is ridiculous in the year uh, uh 2000 looking at these movies i cannot imagine yeah i mean here's here's the big difference um this is when how when 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 movie stars still mattered in hollywood um every mm. one of these movies except x-men has a big movie star attached to it missing impossible tom cruise gladiator russell crowe was growing into a really big star cast away tom hanks what yeah. women want uh mel gibson i think is in that movie uh the grinch jim carrey meet the parents yeah. robert de niro and mm. perfect storm george clooney what lies beneath Harrison Ford is in that movie. Michelle Pfeiffer is in that movie. Like movie stars still matter. Stars. Like that. Yep. That's what brought people out to the box office. You know, now, now we know it's brands, it's IP, it's franchises. It, it's, it's, it's the characters themselves. And that's not the case. Um, I guess we should talk about the movie at some point. Um, any thoughts, man, that you just want to share like high level thoughts about X-Men, just like upon rewatch and what you remember. I mean, as I said, the premise of it is like really, really basic. You know, this is really mm -hmm. just like kind of, Charles versus Magneto, you know, the Brotherhood versus the X-Men themselves. They 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 pretty much used, I think, a tried and true formula to introduce these characters to the mainstream. But the story itself is really simple. They kind of focus on a few characters. We do see other mutants like Sabretooth, who, you know, they they wouldn't revisit mm -hmm. Sabretooth until the Wolverine Origins movie, and they, you know, ultimately right. recasted the character. Uh Jean Grey and and and, and Cyclops were, were were they they were the first mutants, you know, to, to be recruited by Charles. So they kept some I think some familiar strands from the comics and the animated series that people had grown to know, but they obviously just made this somewhat of a updated modernization of these characters with the tone, the style, mm -hmm. all of those things. So uh, yeah, just like take the floor, man. What do you, what, what did you think about X-Men just upon your rewatch? 
Yeah, uh, I have way more to say, I think, about X2 and 3, for sure. Kind of to your point, that X-Men 1 does feel like such a basis kind of movie and basic movie. I think I understand they didn't want to, like, swing for the fences, you know what I mean? Which ends up, to me, being, like, the last thing. They were like, we're going to swing on a lot of these things. But uh, I'm kind of glad they kind of kept things contained, because I can't imagine if they messed up the first movie. And then it's like, well, we can't make an X2, you know what I mean? So I'm kind of happy. Uh, that they went in the direction that they did with this this first X Men film, and and, uh, and and upon my rewatch, there's just a, a couple things that I, I think are are smart and endearing. One of them is the relationship between uh, Rogue and Wolverine that they established very early. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was a really smart thing. Of course, Anna Paquin at this time was a kind of a childhood star. She had won that Academy Award. What was that? The piano. Yeah. Um, I think it was. So it was like, again, this is before True Blood. So it was, I, and in the, they decided to, for this to be the rogue before she uh, uh, absorbs the powers of Captain Marvel. So it was just like very different, I think, for people to see this version of Rogue. And, and, and one other thing is when they've, when a lot of people start X Men, when X Men starts, they tend to focus on a, uh, a, a a teenage girl, right? I mean, we start with Jubilee in the animated series. Here, we start with Rogue. I think Evolution starts with Kitty Pride. I think, like, yeah. they've just always kind of started with the, the the teenage girl, and they've been kind of, like, changing. I wonder if they're going to do that with uh, when X-Men comes in the MCU. Maybe they pick another teenage girl to focus on. I thought that was interesting, but I, I, I love the different angle that they take there. Uh, and, and, and it's also the, the relationship between Rogue and... and um, in, in Wolverine is just cool because they were again establishing some comedy very early too. They're drop the moment they're driving in the car, <laughs> and she's like, "You should wear a seatbelt." And he hits a tree and just goes flying. I'm like, "This is hilarious!" <laughs> like it happens so fast. Like it was like no amount of time in between when he said that. It's like they literally waited like ten seconds. Uh, but yeah, this it, it was just a, a a fun I think uh, movie to, to to reminisce about in my rewatch. Nothing too much to say, um, but they did do a lot. I, I I like the villains. I like how they had Toad. I was like, whoa! They decided to pick Toad out of all these people. That felt like a, but it a wasn't, bit of a risky choice. He wouldn't be the first. He wouldn't be the first. You know, evil you know so, sort of mutant that I would have like put on the on the chessboard to be a character in this movie exactly and he's kind of cool like yeah. uh, at first you see him you're like oh this dude is weird but when we get to the statue of liberty scene it's like this dude's just kind of whooping everybody's ass <laughs> um uh also i have i gotta bring up mystique we're gonna oh my god just what they were able to do with the cgi on mystique i remember reading something watching something that like they didn't really know how cgi worked at this time yet like it was still a very new thing for them and they had to go to other movie sets to like figure out like the other people that were doing it well to like figure out how to embed it with an X-Men because you're going to need some CGI for a superhero film, right? Uh, you know, you think think about what they do to the senator and they make him into a mutant and he's doing all these blobby things and stuff. But it's 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 just a really cool, uh, I think, you know, idea to have to borrow from somebody else and then make it look as good as they did because Mystique looks tremendous in this movie um and of course they go on to refine it and it looks even better throughout time but they did such a good job and i, I really like the fight between mystique and wolverine where it's two wolverines it's like w- one thing about this trilogy of films they don't have i mean one of, one of the downfalls is probably the, right the fight choreography it's not the best we know that but they were doing some some decent ideas you know some decent very nerdy comic booky things in these early films and i thought um they they did a good job of kind of coming up with some stuff to keep us being like huh that was a cool idea so yeah it's it's, it's been really cool yeah i think uh what stood out to me the most upon rewatching this movie i think that um the character introductions in this film are great I loved how they introduced everybody into the movie. I think that uh, you get the the whole setup with with a young Eric, you know, before he's Magneto, fourteen year old yeah. boy, Nazi occupied Poland. Like that's such a central figure mm-hmm. figure point of his of his characterization. Such just a well known moment, and 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 the way that they communicated that, and the way that that scene took place in the in the opening moments of the movie. Um, I think it just kind of speaks to the direction of this entire franchise at this particular point, like how grounded they were truly trying to make everything. They wanted they wanted to to feel as human as possible, as if it could really happen in our real world. And, and what better way to achieve that than to go back to his young upbringing to showcase, you know, some of the the racism and the bigotry that he was, of course, dealing with at that time being a, a, a young Jewish boy. But 
then to also like add the layer on top of him being a mutant at that, you know, and what he went through and seeing his par parents get murdered, you know, right in front of his face. But then also the character introduction of, of Wolverine and the fight cage, like that was mm -hmm. really, really dope to me. Um, and throughout all these scenes, I'm like, yo, this cinematography is really, really great on this movie. Like they shot it pretty well. I loved how mm -hmm. everything looked. Um, and I think, again, with the choices made, even though we know things would evolve and become more colorful and more fantastical. And we wanted to explore these really comic booky style places and, and, and all of those different things in, in, in future films. This was really, really, you know, taking more of a more of a grounded approach that I think, you know, at the time it worked, you know, that's kind of what they felt like they had to do. It, it was it was certainly a choice to to be risk averse just because of what happened with Batman and Robin. I think that, you know, at the time the thinking was was sound, you know, they kind of had to go in a different direction. And we had to, you know, sort of earn our way back to do some of the more yeah. goofy things, to do some of the more silly, playful things that comic books really are at the end of the day. That's like a part of the DNA. You know, you can't get away from mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, you know, we, they have the <laughs> they have the joke in here that also just got like referenced in X Men ninety seven. You know, when they talk about the costumes, when Wolverine officially gets his costume and he's looking at it like, what the, like, what is this? And Scott's <laughs> like, what do you think we were gonna wear? Yellow spandex? You know, and um, mm -hmm. they played. They played, you know, fun with that in X-Men 97 with the black leather joke that, that they circle back to, which is like a real full circle moment. Um, yeah. I forgot to bring this up in the development of the movie, but Kevin Feige worked on this film. You know, he was an associate producer mm -hmm. on this movie. This is really where he got to start. He was interning with Laura Shuler Donner, you know, in Hollywood at that particular point. Very, very young, had not really made any movies before, but this was like his first big movie. And uh, this was set in motion him being kind of the kingpin of Hollywood for a long time and being the president and, and the creative visionary behind Marvel studios and the MCU. Um, but he, he got to start here, you know, which is, which is just so interesting yeah. to think about that they are now actively developing a new X-Men movie in the MCU. And we're hearing about possible director choices and things like that. Like it's kind of mm -hmm. crazy how, how time just works itself out, you know, and these things all sort of sort of create these full circle moments. You're going to say something right there. Yeah. I, I remember, uh, I remember seeing something that James Cameron was trying to produce in this film like james cameron at one point wanted wanted to be a producer sure. on x-men one uh but what's funny he got inspired i think by stan lee to potentially d d uh be the director for spider-man it's just crazy how like all this turns out james cameron ends up not doing superhero anything but yeah. like from x-men to spider-man is just it's just crazy thought to think about yeah yeah and was gonna cast leonardo dicaprio as peter parker you know that was gonna be his uh his, his first <laughs> casting choice which uh again would have completely changed everything we know about <laughs> leo i mean here's a guy who has become you know the most in-demand powerful actor of his generation and he's never done a franchise you know he's never he's never attached himself to anything like that he didn't have to i mean after titanic like mm -hmm. you know you don't need to do anything. You don't never have to really work again. You can just ride off, the world. Of, off your fandom. Yeah. And uh, James Cameron, now he's actively shitting on superhero movies. I love it when he just takes a shot. He's just like, <laughs> oh, yeah, Thanos, that's CGI. Yeah, it's cool, but it's not It's not my shit. Go check out Avatar <laughs> 2. Like, check out what I'm doing here. Um, so he, he's he's obviously having fun with it. But, yeah, man, I think, um, you know, this this movie, it's good foundation. You know, you, you sort it of is. alluded to it. It's really, really good foundation. The characters that they chose for this make a lot of sense and, and the focus of it makes a lot of sense um they do and i and i'll this, this kind of continues throughout the entire trilogy here um i don't know if you want to speak to this but they really do focus on more of the political about the yeah. x-men like mm -hmm. and it's interesting because we're coming off of x-men 97 we're coming off of x-men the animated series where we're leaning into the comics we're leaning into those very well-known villains it wouldn't be until later we would start to see villains like apocalypse and we still haven't mm -hmm. seen mr sinister you know all of these right. like Big, big personalities, but in the first three movies, the villains are Magneto, Senator Kelly, Senator yeah. Kelly, Stryker, and yeah. a cure. That like the cure is like the enemy in the third one. Like that there's is not the really villain. no, you're that's right. That's like the villain. It's not really an <laughs> Phoenix -ish. enemy. Phoenix ish. Phoenix ish. Um, without the ish. actual Phoenix, just like the split personality type shit. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about that? I mean, again, I think that it kind of speaks to the grounded nature of it. You know, to to avoid the the more fantastical elements of X-Men comics, but we don't get any of those iconic villains really that, that I think we mostly associate with this group of characters. Yeah. It, it, it's such an interesting choice, but it still kind of makes sense. I think given the landscape of, of where, where things were and even thinking about um, X-Men, you know, the animated series in the nineties, there is, you know, at least uh, of course it does start with like Sentinels. Right. But a lot of, a lot of our early, um, um, villains were like Trask <laughs> and Senator Kelly and some of these other people. And so it, 
they and they start with politics very early. Like they come out the gate, jeans up there talking about, you know, we talking about mutant uh what's what's it called when they have to uh t- tell you who they are mutant registration oh, act registration, yeah. and all the uh, you know and all these other things and it's 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 just i don't know man it's so but it's such a political time like again those early 2000s is like very it seems it feels very important at least to to uh to what's going on um because y2k right is a whole thing <laughs> that's a whole nother ball game and then we elect George W. Bush. And it's just like, uh, yeah, it just, it just felt, it just made sense with, I think what was happening to go that, to do that approach again, especially we're trying to stay grounded. Can you imagine the first movie and apocalypse comes in? We would have been like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> like, I just feel like we would have been lost or like maybe too much too fast. You know what I mean? But it seems like they were trying to ease us into what could be more potentially down the line. Again, the last thing they try to go for something else. Again, they don't really succeed at any of it. But I think, like, what if that was the first movie? Like, what do we have even gotten here? You know what I mean? So I think they were just keep it maintained. There's a lot of politicalness, both in the cartoon and the comic. Let's just, let's just see how this feels, and then we can go from there. Jim Carrey is Apocalypse? No? Nobody want to see <laughs> Jim Carrey come in and be Apocalypse? I get he already That's done the crazy. Riddler at that point, which uh, yeah. feels a little bit more appropriate than Apocalypse would. But uh, It does, for sure. No, you're right, though. I mean, I, re- I remember watching, like, that 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 sequence of Jean Grey at the, at the, at the hearing um, mm-hmm. in, I believe it was D.C. Like, that used to be an era of movies. Like, there were, there was always, like... There was always like political hearings and movies. Was like, always the Pentagon. There was Pentagon always the was Pentagon, <laughs> the Capitol, like this big group of of, of yeah. people in a room talking through like mm-hmm. national issues. Like we don't really see that at all anymore. Uh, it's just got so interesting. Like <laughs> either got sick of it or um, uh, maybe maybe more distrusting of the of the government at large because mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. a lot of. Um, there was just a lot of military and nationalistic yeah. propaganda in movies. That's really kind of what Absolutely. it boils down to. Like, how mm-hmm. can we, how can we, you know, sort of inject the national image and message in movies as much as possible? And, and a lot of, to be honest, a lot of that stuff I liked. I liked how, yeah, I liked how big mm-hmm. stories used to feel. They felt like national yeah. issues. You watch any of these movies, like you said, there was always those moments of being in a courtroom or a Senate hearing or at the Pentagon or something like that. Whereas now things are just not that way anymore. There's not really uh, issues coming up like that in films anymore. Um, but yeah, overall, man, I think, um, you know, X-Men, it did what it needed to do, obviously, at the box office, like we talked about. Reception-wise, it did pretty good. Um, and and, and it, was, it was successful enough, obviously, for Fox to go ahead and immediately want to do a sequel and to turn this into a franchise and stuff. So.